Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar titled A Novel Blood-Based Biomarker for Silent Cerebral Edema and Brain Vascular Injury. This webinar is part of the Neuroscience 2021 and I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Luminix. For more information about Luminix, please go to www.luminexcorp.com. So let's get started. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that this event is interactive, and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during this presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. And if you have any trouble hearing or seeing this presentation, simply click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. As a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credits. Click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right corner of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain those credits. Without further ado, I now present today's speaker, Dr. Jason Hinman an Associate Professor and Vice Chair of Research in the Department of Neurology at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Welcome, Dr. Henry. You can join us now and begin your presentation. Thank you, Susie, and good morning, everyone. Um, glad you're able to join us. Uh, I'm going to tell three interesting stories today and try to convince you first about why we should be caring about silent brain vascular injury. Uh, second, some work from my laboratory trying to identify new molecular pathways that can lead us to therapies and diagnostics for uh, brain vascular injury. And thirdly, uh, the work we've done using Illuminex platform to identify a novel blood-based biomarker that can measure uh, silent cerebral edema and brain vascular injury. I have uh, relevant disclosures regarding grant funding, and some of the work we've done today has been patented by the University of California. Cerebral small vessel disease is uh, a frustrating entity as a uh, clinician. Um, it is a chronic and progressive disease of the brain's small vasculature, usually the uh, micron-sized arterioles and capillaries uh, that uh, make up the majority of the blood supply in the brain. Occlusion of these small blood vessels accounts for about a quarter of all strokes in the United States annually. And uh, the damage to the brain, the, these small blood vessels can occur in, in several different manners or patterns. The first is you can have a lesion like this one here in the upper left MRI picture, where you have an acute subcortical ischemic event, also known as a stroke. And if it's localized to the correct portion of the brain, it leads to clinical symptoms that may bring one to the emergency room. There is a, and again, that accounts for about a quarter of all strokes in the US annually. There is a, another much larger portion of patients in which those lesions are occurring, but they happen to be occurring in portions of the brain that one is not using regularly uh, and those uh, are often referred to as silent or uh, diffuse white matter lesions that appear on MRI scans, often done for another reason, headache or uh, other things. And with the advent of increasing power in MRI signals, we now recognize that these tiny infarcts can occur as here in the upper right, uh, far right uh, MRI image uh, in a very small arterial that perfuse the, the surface of the brain. We call those cortical microinfarcts. Um, as I mentioned, the, um, the, the prevalence estimate of these types of lesions, particularly the latter two, far exceed the number of patients who come to the emergency room with a small vessel ischemic stroke. And it's estimated that, that these may be occurring as, as many as one to two million times a year in individuals but without clinical symptoms they're not coming in for care immediately. Over time, though, these clinical these lesions accumulate, and the clinical symptoms then become cognitive impairment, dementia, dysfunctionality, and gait, and other uh, types of symptoms. So there's a very frustrating clinical entity because it's hard to measure. Um, 
Uh, it has a significant impact though. Uh, and w one thing we know is that these lesions go up with age substantially. Um, I'm showing data from a, a, a significant meta-analysis done um, indicating that much like Alzheimer's disease or other neurodegenerative diseases, this uh, damage that occurs silently to the brain increases as one goes into the sixth, seventh, eighth, and onward decades of life. Uh, and we know that they also in significantly increase the risk of having a stroke. I'll show you some data on that. It's about three and a half times normal. And we also know that they increase the risk of dementia by disrupting brain connectivity. So first, the data on how these lesions um, increase the risk of stroke. Uh, this, again, data from a prominent meta-analysis in which um, the estimate uh, of folks who have white matter lesions, the silent ischemic damage, uh, who, who subsequently uh, have a risk for stroke is, is approximately three and a half times. You can see that was fairly consistent across studies and even higher in populations that were characterized as high risk. We'll talk about those in a moment. Uh, if one has uh, these white matter uh, ischemic lesions in the brain, you're much more likely when having occlusion of one of those vessels to have symptoms, can, persistent symptoms that would be classified as a stroke, as opposed to transient symptoms that resolve or what we call a TIA. So you increase the likelihood of your symptoms progressing to actual ischemic damage to the brain if you have these baseline microvascular injuries. Similarly, the size of one stroke is also increased. Um, this is data from a group in MGH from some years ago in which they were able to track the progression of, this, of a stroke over the first 12 days uh, in patients with or without uh, these ischemic white matter lesions. And what you can see from the, um, the, the, uh, the left DWI images that over time in the presence of these uh, uh, white matter ischemic lesions, the infarct becomes much larger and it uh, uh, fills in the area of low brain perfusion that was present on the initial scan, uh, as opposed to not having uh, these underlying uh, lesions. And importantly, in patients receiving acute thrombolysis or mechanical thrombectomy as a treatment for stroke, in the presence of these white matter ischemic lesions, the outcome uh, 90 days after the stroke is much, uh, much more uh, uh, significant than, and the treatment less successful than if you do not have these uh, lesions. And so they clearly have an impact on stroke, both the diagnosis, the risk, the, the uh, likelihood of progressing to clinical symptoms, size of one stroke, and the, the ultimate treatment outcome. Similarly, these white matter lesions uh, significantly increase the risk of dementia. Uh, this is a population-based study looking purely at the risk of stroke um, and its association with uh, an increased risk of dementia. And you can see that even in folks who have a small uh, stroke uh, in the, in the or a TIA in the very lightest line along the bottom of the graph, or in the uh, line just above that, a fairly minor stroke is judged by clinical symptoms. There's still a substantial 10 to 15, sometimes out to five years, 20% risk of uh, progressing to uh, a clinical dementia. And uh, this, is an, this is not clearly understood, uh, but one reason that a small stroke could attribute to this phenomenon is evidenced by, by this, uh, this work uh, from uh, colleagues in Europe. Uh, I showed you two examples of the stroke lesions, the small one that occurs acutely uh, or the, the numerous ones that it can occur silently. But in a group of patients that are, have a monogenic disorder called catacyl that are inevitably uh, going to get these smaller uh, stroke lesions like that, that pictured in the upper left MRI, uh, and if you follow those patients over a year, because of their monogenic condition, they're um, inevitably getting these lesions. And you employ modern MRI techniques like tractography. You can uh, identify the areas of the cortex that uh, those axons supply. Uh, 
Uh, and what you see is that after a small infarct like that, even though it's occurred in the deep portion of the brain, uh, the manifestation uh, can also affect the cortex where you see thinning of the surface of the brain, the connected region that was impacted by the, the uh, subcortical stroke. And so this is a, the idea behind how these types of small lesions can still have a lasting and significant impact uh, on the brain. They have that distant effect, but they also have this unique feature uh, of local progression. Uh, again, in that same series of patients who get inevitable progressive lesions, it's a useful cohort to follow over time. And what we see and when we do that is that uh, new lesions uh, like that pictured in the right MRI scan in the upper left tend to occur within regions where they've already been damaged as evidenced by the, the bright white signal on MRI. So this leads to a model then where new lesions are appearing at the leading edge or the penumbral edge of the, uh, of the vascular damage. Uh, there's been some elegant work from colleagues at UC Davis showing that uh, in patients who have these white matter hyperintensities, the, the, the most uh, easily measurable uh, MRI metric of conductivity uh, diffusion tensor imaging also drops out in that region just where the uh, white matter hyperintensities occur at the leading edge. My lab has done some work to characterize uh, the, these abnormalities using human pathology specimens. Uh, and what we see is a, a, uh, in pathology, this is the typical sort of lesion that occurs in the brain after a, 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 a one of those small strokes. You get a, a so-called lacunar infarct. This is where the, the lake of CSF fluid that fills in in the necrotic core. And you get a penumbral region adjacent to that where there's damage. And you characterize, uh, and so what we did was use immunohistochemistry to look at the integrity of myelin and axons uh, in that region. And what you see, uh, in, particularly looking at the, the ultrastructure uh, of uh, axons, which can be characterized by molecular markers like uh, voltage-gated sodium channels that label the node of Ranvier and adjacent paranodal segments uh, where the myelin makes contact with the axon. And what you see is when you look in the region uh, just adjacent to the stroke, is that in, in normal appearing brain, you get this nice bow type pattern as you see in the diagram at the top. But in the region adjacent to the stroke pictured in the right center, you see that the, both the nodal and paranodal segments elongate consistent with a breakdown of the normal structure of axons in that penumbral region. We quantified that showing that even if you go a significant distance away from that uh, core lesion, uh, you, you still have abnormalities in axons that are present uh, some distance away from the infarct itself. Uh, and we show that this phenomenon is also true in a related uh, uh, series of patients with, um, again, monogenic uh, uh, ischemic disease uh, and get, who get these patchy lesions throughout their brain white matter. And they have similar elongations of axonal uh, microdomains uh, in the adjacent region. So it's a progressive phenomenon that um, has both local and distant uh, impacts on the brain. Now, one thing we recognize is that vascular risk factors are one of the conditions in which these lesions tend to get worse. So beyond age, we also see a substantial increase when we look at um, the association of stroke, these white matter lesions, and vascular risk. First, we'll look at the association of stroke, and it occurs at multiple different levels. First, it occurs at the epidemiologic level. On the top, you see in purple a map of stroke rates across the U.S., and you can see a relatively increased risk in what is termed the stroke belt uh, in the southeast. Uh, in orange, you see a map of uh, rates or incidence of diabetes across the U.S. And you can, uh, it doesn't take much to hallucinate that these maps overlap significantly with each other. And in the bottom right, you see a map of obesity rates across the U.S. And again, similar 
uh, shared patterns uh, across uh, high-risk uh, patients. Uh, this uh, data is from a, a very nice paper looking at the risk of stroke and cardiovascular outcomes associated with type 2 diabetics with or without risk factor control. And so what you can see in the graph is that as gl uh, glycated hemoglobin, systolic blood pressure, and uh, cholesterol levels, LDL cholesterol levels increase to the right, you see the risk or hazard ratio of having a stroke uh, uh, goes up substantially, nearly doubling in some cases. Uh, and then similar to what I showed earlier, uh, folks who have these vascular risk factors don't do well even when treated. Uh, and so this is the risk of a poor outcome if you have high blood sugar upon presentation uh, for treatment with a stroke, uh, nearly doubling the risk of a bad outcome. And uh, again, we see that uh, the risk of ischemic white matter disease is further accelerated in the presence of these uh, vascular risk factors. So I showed this figure earlier, the risk of a stroke in a high-risk population defined in this study as folks who had uncontrolled vascular risk factors like high blood pressure and diabetes, uh, the, the rate is, uh, risk of a stroke is even higher. Uh, and we know that uh, in this data, the risk of uh, the progression of ischemic white matter lesions goes up similarly whether you have, in the presence of hypertension, in fact, whether it's controlled or not controlled. Um, a condition uh, that is a constellation of vascular risk factors in obesity called metabolic syndrome uh, also increases the progression or, or detection of these ischemic white matter lesions in the brain. And, um, and again, here, just a table, again, emphasizing the same point, the risk of a new lacunar stroke, as evidenced on MRI, show, as I showed examples of earlier, goes up substantially, nearly doubling uh, with uh, uh, specific vascular risk factors. So it's a lot of data in this area, and there's been a lot of research interest. If you do a PubMed search for white matter hyperintensities, uh, another term for the ischemic brain vascular injury I showed early on, it's, it's gone up exponentially in the last uh, decade. However, it's not translated yet to specific treatments designed to target this particular entity of cerebral small vessel disease. The best clinical data is a relatively routine addition of uh, clopidogrel to aspirin uh, for patients with this type of brain uh, disease. And that trial was negative with no added benefit of the addition of a second antiplatelet drug. So uh, this has been frustrating and uh, the uh, National Institutes of Health has made a tremendous investment in trying to do better to understand neurovascular contributions to uh, aging, uh, age-related uh, cognitive impairment and, and the risk associated with um, uh, uh, for progression of cognitive disease in patients with uh, stroke diagnoses. I'm highlighting here uh, several of the substantial investments that NIH has made in understanding what is now called vascular cognitive impairment and dementia, or VCID, just in the last 10 years, uh, even last five years. Uh, NIH has invested uh, $50 million in a multi-site consortium called Mark VCID. I'll tell you about that in a moment. We've been fortunate to be involved in that uh, with the goal of identifying specific imaging and fluid biomarkers to pick up this silent brain vascular injury. Uh, we're also participating in a large study that I'll tell you about at the end of uh, our, uh, our talk today uh, to identify how a stroke impacts the risk of dementia uh, afterwards. And then another study uh, headed by UC Davis and colleagues uh, called Diverse VCID, which is specifically looking at uh, how these uh, lesions vary in diverse uh, uh, clinical populations. Uh, and we've been very fortunate to be involved in, in the Mark BCID consortium, which of those three is uh, moving along most significantly. And the purpose here is to really identify molecular uh, biomarkers, imaging and molecular biomarkers that can function at the interface between stroke and Alzheimer's disease, an area termed vascular cognitive impairment. Uh, and it's a seven-site consortium, and we've been participating as a West Coast group 
with colleagues at several other UCs. Now, uh, what's the point? Why should we, I, I mean, I tried to show you the evidence that it's important to care about ischemic white matter disease because it does so much to damage the brain and increase the risk of stroke and dementia. Um, but, you know, biomarkers are, they're interesting, but they're, they can be very noisy. And so why should we care? What impact will it have clinically? And to that, we need to uh, just step one quickly back and look at the Alzheimer's field. Um, if we look briefly at the Alzheimer's field, I'll, I'll give two examples, but the first is from a study that looked at amyloid scanning, a new technique to measure brain amyloid uh, via PET scanning, expensive undertaking, some risk associated with the, uh, 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 with the study. Um, but uh, Medicare really wanted to know if they should be considering paying for such a, such a study. And in this beautifully organized uh, study, uh, what they were able to show is that increased diagnosis through, in this case, imaging biomarker, uh, resulted in a management change in over 60% of patients. And in fact, the diagnosis changed in nearly 35% of those patients. So there's clear evidence that, that um, adding more information to a relatively noisy area can be particularly helpful clinically. Um, similarly, if we look specifically at vascular risk factors, the, uh, again, uh, really impressive SPRINT trial that looked at the control of uh, blood pressure, aggressive control of blood pressure versus standard uh, control, uh, resulted in a reduced risk of uh, cognitive impairment with aggressive uh, risk factor control. And so there's reason to uh, identify and, and do better if, and if, using uh, biomarkers. All right, so we'll move on to the second part of the talk, and I'll tell the second story. And my laboratory focuses on identifying the molecular pathways that we can use that are relevant to this disease um, and how we can use them to uh, improve treatment and diagnosis. My lab uses several approaches to address this. One is we try to uh, model chronic cerebrovascular risk and understand um, the molecular pathways uh, that are associated with that. Uh, we have several models that we use in the lab in which we can introduce a small stroke lesion like the one I showed in human pathology early on. And we can use that model uh, to understand molecular pathways that are active in the stroke. We're collectively combining that to uh, identify new therapeutic approaches, and I'll show you a, a, a limited set of data on that. Um, and importantly, we think it's really important to take all of that rodent and basic work and apply it to the human condition, because that's really what we're interested in trying to solve. Uh, and so we always work to valid, try to validate our model findings in humans. And our basic science story that I'm about to tell you will ultimately lead to um, some uh, work in humans to try to validate our findings. So one way we get at those molecular pathways in the lab is to use a technique called translating ribosome affinity purification. This is a technique some may be familiar with in which you can add uh, antigenic tags to ribosomes. And that can be really helpful for a noisy cellular tissue like the brain where you have multiple different cell types um, and it's hard to uh, uh, get at the very specific cellular uh, uh, molecular programs that might be active. And it has several advantages even over uh, single cell sequencing in that you're getting mRNA messages that are specifically associated with ribosomes, so on their way to being translated. Uh, and you can, by that technique, usually get substantial uh, uh, increased uh, sequencing depth that can really uh, inform uh, 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 for low abundance proteins. Uh, so what we did was uh, try to take that translating ribosome affinity purification technique and see if we couldn't apply it to endothelial cells in the setting of uh, a chronic cerebrovascular factor. And we chose to use obesity for several reasons. One, I showed you the maps. Rates in the U.S. are going up substantially. There's a, a significant overlap with the risk of stroke and, and cerebrovascular disease. Uh, and it's fairly simple to model in the laboratory. You place mice with a specific genetic background on a high calorie diet. They get very overweight as shown in the picture. Uh, the graph demonstrates the weight over time increase 
And the table here shows that they develop a, a serum profile that looks very much like many of the patients uh, in which there's hypertriglyceridemia, high cholesterol, uh, uh, elevated levels of glucose, and, and they get a low-grade hypertension, uh, which I'm not showing here, but it's been well established before. And so what we did then was use this novel mouse strain we created uh, called the endotag mouse, where we used a, an endothelial cre driver together with the, the ribotag mouse to label uh, uh, ribosomes with an antigenic HA tag, specifically in the endothelial cells. And you can see that here in the, in the picture below, just an image of the brain uh, where the blood vessels are labeled in red and the um, ribosomes are labeled in green. And you can see that there's intense ribosomal labeling within the endothelial cells. Then we took those, that strain and placed those animals on the high fat diet and then isolated the white matter, pulled down the uh, HA tag ribosomes via immunoprecipitation, and then uh, sequenced the RNA associated with those ribosomes. And the, uh, the heat map here shows that we specifically enrich for endothelial transcripts using this technique. And the volcano plot shows the number of genes that were up and down regulated uh, in the white matter and the cells in this disease profiling. And I'll draw your attention specifically to two molecules that are pictured in bold. Uh, we'll talk about them a little bit more in a moment. But the IL-17B uh, receptor and uh, a chemokine ligand called CXCL5, which were both substantially upregulated uh, in uh, white matter endothelial cells in this model. When we look at the top uh, genes, and we look not just at those two, but all of the genes that were upregulated as a disease signature, what we see is this, that obesity drives a very specific immune activation in, in endothelial cells, upregulating both IL-17, IL-25, and chemokine signaling. Uh, and this led us to focus on these particular ligands, which were among those top genes driving this uh, uh, molecular signal. Specifically, we created a proposed signaling cascade in which IL-17B circulating in the bloodstream then binds to its cognate receptor, IL-17B, which we showed is upregulated. Uh, and that triggers uh, uh, the expression of CXCL5, which could have both local paracrine effects in the brain and also potentially be secreted into the bloodstream. This chemokine ligand is important because it acts on neutrophils and other cells as a homing signal. I am in danger, please come and find me. Uh, and, uh, and so in that context, it can act as a very important um, uh, indicator of, of chronic injury. And we showed when we went back to brain tissue that um, IL-17B IL is specifically, that the receptor is specifically upregulated in these um, uh, uh, damaged endothelial cells in, in animals on the high fat diet. And then uh, if you look specifically, we also see uh, upregulation of this chemokine ligand CXCL5 in brain uh, blood vessels. Um, and in fact, we also can find CXCL5 present in human uh, uh, brain in endothelial cells shown here in the brown and uh, immunochemistry signal, specifically within the blood vessels in patients with uh, cerebral small vessel disease. I'll show some more data on that at the end. Uh, so using this signaling cascade, uh, you know, this was a proposed idea. We showed it's upregulated in the tissue, but does this make sense? Does it actually lead to uh, direct signaling? And so what we showed is that um, in animals on the high fat diet, you can find increased levels of circulating CXCL5. Uh, and uh, we showed that <clears throat> uh, here in the middle graph. But that doesn't really convince you what we did was take, uh, go to an in vitro model in which we took human brain and endothelial cells and stimulated them with various IL-17 ligands. There are five significant ones, A through E. And when we stimulated uh, human brain and endothelial cells with these various ligands, we saw a very specific increase in the secretion of CXCL5, response to multiple IL-17 ligands, but most robustly and with the least variance with IL-17B, indicating a novel signaling cascade in human brain uh, between uh, IL-17B 
its cognate receptor and the secretion of CXCL5. Now, we wanted to test whether this system was active uh, and, and to tr move to an in vivo model. And so what we did then was take animals on a high fat diet uh, and uh, administer a function blocking IL-17B antibody. We did that peripherally through an IP injection. And what it does is block the uh, gobbles up all the IL-17B such that it's not available to its receptor. And if our system is true, uh, then we should reduce CXCO5 levels. And in fact, that's exactly what we see. The middle graph show, the middle uh, images show that in, when we administer control IgG, we still see a robust upregulation in green of CXCL5. And when we administer anti-IL-17B antibodies, we still see the receptors upregulated, but we've dropped the level of CXCL5 in the cognate vessels. And uh, we can use imaging techniques to co-localize those together and then measure that uh, intensity. And you can see with the anti-IL-17B treatment, we drop the level of CXCL5 in the, in the, in the uh, tissue. Now, what does all that mean? Uh, well, one of the important um, uh, functions of the receptor uh, of the signaling cascade and, and um, the, the function of the white matter is to maintain myelin. And the key cell that does that is a stem cell referred to as the oligodendrocyte progenitor cell. So we rationalized that if CXCL5 was present uh, in, in, and functioning in a paracrine uh, fashion, it might re recruit oligodendrocyte progenitor cells, the stem cell, the, the major stem cell population of the white matter, to these injured blood vessels, uh, because that's its function in the immune system as a homing migration signal. Maybe it works the same way to uh, uh, modulate this stem cell. And so that's exactly what we see. We did, uh, again, two experiments, one where we administered the function blocking anti-IL-17B. Um, and what you see there, um, and then the other method we used was to overexpress the XCO5 in the vessel using a targeted lentiviral approach. Um, and when we do that, what we and then we measure the distance of the oligodendrocyte progenitor cell from the uh, blood vessel. And what you can see when we overexpress CXCL5 in normal weight animals, we drive the OPC to the vessel. It becomes much closer as shown in the micrograph, uh, two examples shown in the micrograph. When we block uh, IL-17B signaling using the function blocking IL-17B antibody uh, in, the, in control IgG, we see again OPCs you know, associated with the vessel as shown here. And then when we block it, we see that the OPCs are maintaining their normal distance uh, and association with the vessel, but not uh, specifically grabbing onto it uh, as might be expected in those um, uh, overexpressing CXCO5. And you can see the, uh, the interesting heat map plot there in the bottom left shows OPC distance from vessel and the, the proportion of cells that we that we quantitated uh, in the different dietary conditions and so we can either um, we can block that signal by disrupting this signaling cascade so uh, I think what we what we've tried to show and I think what this work demonstrates is that we can go from transcription all the way to secretion both in vivo and in the circulation I'd like to spend the rest of the talk talking about how we really wanted to show could this disease this inflammatory signal be associated with um, uh, a, a novel biomarker for the detection of brain vascular injury. Uh, and so again, taking the um, transcriptional signature and going all the way from in the rodent, all the way to um, secreted signals in the human. So to do that, we, we wanted to turn to uh, Luminex and I'll tell you why it made a lot of sense. The first is, we, you know, we were looking for a novel signature. And so we came up with these, these proteins that we had identified in, in red that were upregulated in our disease model, likely to be secreted based on existing evidence or known biology. Um, but you know, to do that alone didn't make a lot of sense. We wanted to anchor that with um, other biomarkers that were known to associate uh, with um, uh, white matter injury and brain vascular injury. And so we chose a, a, a wide series of those uh, based on the literature. Uh, 
Um, and so what we really had then was a multiplex. But, you know, we're talking now about moving to human samples in which specimens are rare, hard to come by, uh, and, uh, and you want to maximize the ability to use them. And so what we did was work with, um, with R&D and Biotechni and Luminex to create a custom panel that would allow us to measure many of these proteins in the same serum specimen. So what we focused on then was um, both these the molecules in red that make up this cerebrovascular endothelial injury network, including the IL-17 and CXCL5 signaling. And then among these molecules that were all independently associated with uh, brain vascular injury, we noticed that several of them also formed a network that was focused on IL-18, what we call the peripheral inflammatory network. or um, and uh, and then we set out to test those. Illuminex made, again, a lot of sense for this kind of protein multiplexing because we wanted to jam all of these proteins into a single assay so that we could use just a small amount of serum or plasma and measure uh, all, all of these immune signals. Um, and so, and then the, the idea was we could use all of them together to create a single uh, score that represented each of the two networks I talked about. And I think this audience is familiar with the idea of multiplexing, so I won't go into that in great detail. So first, uh, to try to conf uh, confirm our uh, cerebral endothelial injury network shown on the right, uh, we took advantage of a study we had done at UCLA uh, looking at patients who came in the emergency room at risk for cerebrovascular disease with a potential diagnosis of stroke. Uh, but not necessarily unconfirmed at the time when they presented. Um, and we, we collected serum from those patients. Uh, we performed uh, MRI in nearly 130 out of 200 subjects. Uh, we graded those MRI scans for the degree of white matter injury using a common subjective scale, performed a multiplex luminex assay uh, on the serum, uh, and then worked to identify if we saw any upregulation of our uh, inflammatory signals. And what you can see from that data is that we can separate a population. Uh, we have measurable levels of IL, IL-17B, it's a very low abundant cytokine. So many patients did not have measurable levels. And if you look at the, the this is plotted now against the level of CXCL5. And so what we see is that in individuals, in all of our subjects, those who have measurable levels of IL-17B also have substantially increased levels of CXCL5 are significantly increased. And if you look specifically at those who are diagnosed with an acute microvascular stroke, we also see that this separates well, that there's a population of IL-17B CXCL5 positive patients that can be distinguished. And if you look at those patients and separate them based on the amount of cerebrovascular burden that they have underlying, uh, those with IL-17B have substantially increased um, uh, uh, physica scores compared to uh, those who do not have measurable IL-17B. This is a, a common way, a shift analysis of looking at an ordinal scale, which the modified physica scale is. It's, um, if you have zero, you have no white matter brain lesions. If you have six, you have substantial. And you can see that um, there's, uh, first of all, no normal patients in the IL-17B positive grouping. Um, and so there's a, a substantial shift in the number of patients who have modest uh, white matter hyperintensities. And in a separate population of human subjects, we showed that they're, uh, uh, in the postmortem specimens with vascular disease, they have a, a substantial uh, labeling for CXCL5 in the brain blood vessels. And that's plotted in the bottom right. Now, we wanted to anchor that again against the existing data. And um, again, the molecules that form this um, peripheral inflammatory network centered on a, a different cytokine, IL-18, uh, that's a pro-inflammatory cytokine. Uh, each of these had been independently associated with white matter lesions, uh, mostly in large cohort studies. Uh, but we wanted to know whether that what we had a, a second uh, strong indicator suggesting that inflammation was a key driver of uh, uh, white matter injury. And so we turned to our colleagues at UCSF who had been maintaining a population of um, 
uh, uh, patients who were uh, at risk for cognitive impairment, but without known cerebrovascular disease, and did a similar study in which we collected um, uh, uh, plasma or serum biospecimens, as well as advanced imaging. And in this case, we were able to do research grade three Tesla MRI along with diffusion tensor uh, uh, imaging in, in a significant number of those patients. And then we looked for uh, whether this inflammatory network, as measured by the multiplex luminex assay, could associate with those MRI indicators. And uh, just a brief note, another advantage of the luminex platform is that it's highly accurate. Uh, and so what we observed in, in, a, in the combined measurement of both studies, uh, very few subjects have high coefficients of variance uh, in technical, duplicate, or triplicate. They um, uh, perform extremely well. We've tested this across different plates, different users, and even different devices, uh, uh, showing that we have very low aggregate uh, variance between assays. And it can be performed in a serum specimen uh, or plasma specimen less than 50 microliters. Um, and so what you see when we look at that peripheral inflammatory network, uh, if you boil it down to a single inflammatory composite score, uh, what we find is that it associates very uh, significantly with um, known risk factors for cerebrovascular disease, like a prior stroke, high blood pressure, diabetes, or hyperlipidemia. And in fact, if you if you have more one or more of these conditions, your risk or your measurement of inflammatory uh, of the inflammatory composite score goes up uh, uh, accordingly. So it nearly doubles every time you add an additional uh, vascular risk factor. Uh, and uh, importantly, it, it associates very clearly with uh, these MRI measures of both white matter hyperintensities, as shown in the middle, uh, uh, the middle MRI graphic, uh, and then also with a, a measure of cerebral edema called free water, uh, shown on the right. Uh, and here we're looking just at dichotomized patients above or below median on the composite score. And what you see on the heat map on the left is those patients uh, participating in the study, uh, their level of each analyte as ordered by their degree of white matter hyperintensity. And so you can see that um, two important factors here. One is that you can clearly see that the composite score associates well with the detection of these white matter hyperintensities. And moreover, uh, the score, the composite score is not driven by a single analyte. If you have high levels of one analyte, you're likely to have them on all, uh, all six. Uh, and the bottom plots show the correlation between uh, white matter hyperintensities on the left in B, and in C, the free white, the free water measurement uh, uh, on D, uh, DTI. Uh, so uh, we had really strong evidence that this was a second uh, uh, biomarker panel that can pick up a brain white matter injury. Uh, and we went and turned back to that UCLA Aspire study uh, uh, to validate that idea. And so uh, here again, we, we had this uh, robust data set of patients at risk for cerebrovascular disease. And what we did here was um, with, with this work, since we were attempting to validate it, uh, we took the entire Luminex uh, custom platform that we had generated and did a principal components analysis and asked what of the, of the biomarkers, the 13 plus biomarkers we were looking at, which ones associated in this study with the physique gets grading of white matter hyperintensities. And what you can see is in the PCA, one factor jumped out significantly. Um, and if you plot that factor against uh, the, um, the already consolidated and known six analyte uh, inflammatory composite score, you get this very tight association. So that score is, is mostly driven by the components of the ICS. Um, and uh, let's see here, we, this slide I don't think quite showed up the way I intended it to, um, but if you go back and look at the Aspire study, um, you can and grade the uh, MRIs based on the Fazika scale into the th three known categories, mild, moderate, severe. You can see that the ICS or inflammatory composite score goes up significantly in patients who have um, a known white matter disease, leading to a nearly 94% specificity uh, for the detection of this silent brain vascular injury. Uh, I intended to show you two MRI scores to show you the dichotomy here between these two types of MRI patterns based on the ICS score, uh, but we had some technical difficulties. So with these tools in hand, 
uh, we're now going to be applying these to um, uh, several of the studies that I mentioned earlier, including um, this one, Discovery. This is a um, really a, what will be a landmark study to identify how stroke influences the risk of dementia, um, which is at least in part driven by these uh, uh, underlying ischemic white matter injury uh, lesions. And we'll be applying the ICS uh, to patients, uh, nearly 2,000 patients uh, uh, who are part of this large cohort. Uh, and I think importantly, we'll be able to discern uh, uh, key ethnic differences in the uh, uh, burden of vascular disease and the risk in which uh, uh, they they also manifest these uh, high levels of biomarkers and and what how they associate with the cognitive impairment uh, that portends that and and that's important because I think it'll give us a window into potential treatment opportunities uh, to reduce the risk uh, uh, of cognitive impairment associated with brain vascular injury. Um, I'll conclude there and then we'll leave hopefully a few minutes for questions. Um, I hope I've shown you that there's an important role for inflammation in the, uh, in the pathogenesis and also the detection of silent brain vascular injury. Um, I tried to show you the convincing evidence that this is a common and progressive disease that has significant risk for long-term brain health, including increasing the risk of stroke and dementia. I tried to show you evidence from both the clinical literature as well as our laboratory evidence that chronic vascular risk factors drive brain vascular inflammation in a way that could th theoretically be uh, therapeutically targeted as we were able to reduce that using an antibody blocking approach. Uh, I'll also try to emphasize the um, important role that analytically reliable biomarkers are a key component of therapeutic development to distinguish the contribution of various injury signals in the brain. And finally, that our six analyte inflammatory composite score is a really robust multi analyte measure of silent brain vascular injury and associates with preclinical cerebral edema. And I think that tool may be particularly useful uh, as we try to move this field forward towards therapeutics. Um, most of the work I showed you today uh, is that of a former postdoc, uh, Guangzhou Zhao, who is now an industry job back in China. Uh, and, um, you know, we do a lot of work, but we also managed to get out uh, in the LA SUD and have some fun occasionally. I'm very grateful to many collaborators at UCLA and other places uh, who are listed. You can follow uh, the lab and its progress on Twitter. And we have many uh, 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 grant funding support that uh, I'm very appreciative for. Uh, I'll stop there and um, hopefully we'll have a few minutes for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Hinman, for that informative presentation. And we will start that live Q&A portion of the webinar now. If you have any questions you want to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. So let's take a look. We already have some great questions from our audience members. Dr. Hinman, do specific cardiovascular risk factors like hypertension or diabetes drive different inflammatory cascades? It's a great question, Susie. I mean, I think, uh, you know, our work from, from our basic science model suggests that there's a significant contribution of IL-17 uh, in the setting of obesity. Now, obesity is a difficult one because it does elevate a number of different, um, a modestly elevated number of different relevant uh, cardiovascular risk factors. But in folks who, say, have high blood pressure but don't, you know, aren't, aren't particularly overweight, uh, there may be uh, specific uh, signaling cascades and inflammatory pathways that are unique to that. We have ongoing work in the lab trying to address that using the same model system that I showed you. Thank you so much. Now, what is the advantage of Luminix over other technologies in multiplex assays? You know, we, you know we, there are m many options now out there, different platforms. Um, many will migrate uh, to different ones based on the availability of different antibodies. But to me, as a physician scientist, the, the reason I like Luminex so much is that they've already done a lot of the hard work to get their diagnostics uh, through to the FDA. And so that, that, that provides a relatively easy path for um, you know, clinical translation. And, and, and we're working in that area as well. 
Thank you so much. And it looks like we have one more question coming in. How far away are we from therapeutics for brain vascular injury? Yeah, that's a, another good question. I think, um, you know, most of the effort and, and funding that I showed you is really focused on slightly upstream of therapeutics, but it's been really driven to try to get us to a, a clinical trial ready system. Uh, you know, I mentioned in the talk how this is a really fuzzy clinical area. People are, you know, patients are getting these lesions and developing symptoms sort of, uh, you know, in a progressive way, but in a, you know, not, not very time locked or, um, you know, somewhat abstract way. And so the, the biomarkers play a really important role then in identifying uh, who has what and who might be a candidate for a therapy. So I think within the next five years, uh, I think you'll see large, uh, scale uh, therapeutic treatment trials begin to target uh, vascular cognitive impairment and dementia uh, using some of the tools that we've been working to develop, uh, including some that I mentioned today. Dr. Hammond, thank you for your time and for your important research. Do you have any closing remarks you would like to add to our audience before we go? Uh, no, uh, uh, not particularly. Just uh, I hope everyone's well and um, I look forward to being able to do this kind of work and this kind of meeting uh, in person soon. Thank you again, Dr. Hinman, and thank you for your time. And before we go, I'd also like to thank our audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. And I'd also like to thank Luminix and LabRoots for today's seminar. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during on our on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand for two years till April of 2023. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care and everyone stay healthy. Bye-bye.